with that, I'll pass it on to Ashley to get started. Thank you so much, Nisa. And hi, everyone. It's so nice to be here today. I'm really looking forward to talking about some bar exam prep tips for you. And I'm going to share, I'm going to screen share in just a minute and share a handout that I think will be helpful. And I'll kind of go through it. I know Nisa has a link to that. If for some reason you don't get the link, just email us. We'll, we'll send it to you. Um, because I think, you know, it'll provide some good resources for you as you study for the bar exam. Just a little bit of an overview. I um, scored a 180 on the MBE portion of the bar exam and a 184 on the essay portion of the bar exam. I do love the bar exam. I'm, I, um, I'm kind of a nerd in that way. I'm, I'm not really good at a lot of things, but I'm good at standardized tests. And so I'm gonna share some of my own tips with you as well as tips that have worked for thousands of our students. I saw some of the questions submitted. I know sometime, some of you are first time takers, some of you are repeat takers. I'll be talking about for, uh, both tips for first time takers and repeat takers and common mistakes that we see bar exam takers make so that hopefully as you start studying for the bar exam, you can be efficient and maximize the time that you have. Because the main concern that people have with bar prep is there's just not enough time to get everything done. Um, I'll be talking mostly about the uniform bar exam, but I'll mention California bar exam and how most state bar exams uh, do things. We provide courses and tutoring for, you know, most of the states, uh, most of the state bar exams, including California. So I'll talk about that also. But let me just start by sharing my screen here so that you can see my handout. Okay, perfect. So I'm going to go through this handout. And um, I just want to start by saying, I'm going to talk about 20 tips. I'm going to go through them quickly, okay, because we have 40 minutes where I'm going to be talking about this. And I'm going to give you just like the, I'm kind of going to uh, boil it down to the most important uh, tips for success. So I think this can really be used as a great resource as we talk about, um, you know, these tips for success here. So just as a quick overview of the bar exam for all the first time takers out there, and I'm giving you an overview of the uniform bar exam, but most state bar exams also have a very similar breakdown. California does as well. So the multi-state bar exam portion is worth 50% of your score. There are going to be 200 MBE questions total, but only 175 are scored. And I want you to know this because after the multiple choice day of the bar exam, a lot of people leave feeling freaked out. They say, oh my God, I didn't know so many of those you know, questions. But oftentimes the questions that they're recalling are likely the test questions, those 25 unscored questions that are kind of wacky. Sometimes they test really new law. Um, sometimes one person will see a test question, another person will see a different test question. So keep that in mind um, as you take the multi-state bar exam. When, when you leave, because some people feel anxious and they don't realize that literally probably most of the questions they're concerned about aren't even scored. So the um, essay portion is worth 30%. So each MEE essay is worth 5% of your score, basically making all six MEEs worth 30%. The essay um, will take you about a half hour per essay if you're in the uniform bar exam jurisdiction. And then the multi-state performance test portion is worth 20%. So the multi-state performance test doesn't test any law. Instead, it'll give you a file, which basically has facts of a case, and a library, which will contain statutes and cases. And you're expected to apply the law to the facts and write like a memo or a brief. I want to point out that it's worth 20%, which is a decent amount, because one of the biggest mistakes I see first-time takers make in particular is they ignore the MPT altogether, and they get a low, they sometimes don't pass the bar exam. I had one student who didn't pass by a point, and um, she didn't use us for the bar exam, but she came to us on her second attempt. She was a great writer. She would have done fantastic on the MBT if she would have just studied for it the first time. She admitted she didn't do one MBT prior to the actual bar exam. And sadly, that's what a lot of students do. They literally won't do one MBT prior to taking the actual bar exam. Um, so some general study tips here. I want to talk about some study schedule tips because I know that that's um, highly asked about. So first, I would recommend that you make a daily study schedule so that you can stay on track with your studying. I recommend that you incorporate watching lecture, reviewing and memorizing the law, and then practicing multiple choice and essay questions. A really big mistake that I particularly see first time takers make is they'll go to lecture 
and then they'll go right from lecture to practicing questions. So they watch their lecture and they say, okay, I've watched torts. Now I'm going to go answer MBE questions and I'm going to go write essays. Um, and then they get stressed out because they don't do very well on the torts MBE questions. So they think they have to do more questions. They don't do well on those. And they, they start to go crazy with answering MBE questions and thinking they have to do something like a hundred a day, which you don't. And the reason that they kind of get in this vicious cycle of just doing a lot of questions and not getting, uh, not seeing a score improvement is because they'll go right from lecture to practicing. They don't take that time in between lecture to actually review and memorize the law. So what we recommend is watch your lecture, all right, if you're a first time takers especially, watch your lecture, and then within 24 hours of that lecture, go through your handout and actually start to commit it to memory. And I'll talk about how to do this in just a minute, but um, that will make a big difference in your scores on the MBE and essay portion, because then you'll actually have a lot to work with. You know, it's not like you're just going to lecture and then trying to answer questions. You have taken time to digest it and review it and memorize it after the lecture. Um, and that way you'll probably see some more exponential improvement in your score rather than just feeling like you're flailing and not seeing a lot of improvement. So here's, oops, didn't mean to click on a link. Here is um, a study schedule for you to look at. This is just kind of like a, a model study schedule, which incorporates lecture, reviewing and memorizing. So like within 24 hours after lecture, essays and MPTs, and then um, like MBE questions for each um, subject. Saving time on lectures. Um, if you are a first time taker, the number one regret I hear first time takers have is they spend all their time watching lectures and they don't actually have time to study. Uh, like they don't review their materials, they don't practice exams because they spent four hours a day at lecture. And um, what I recommend is that you try to find ways to save time and cut down on that lecture if you're not an auditory learner. If you are an auditory learner, meaning you really learn well from lecture and you, you um, maybe you like podcasts, maybe you kind of digest information much better when you hear it, then it might be fine to spend four hours on lecture. But 90% of law students tend to be more visual. And in, in which case, you know, it's probably better to spend a little bit less time on lecture and a little bit more time reviewing the material after lecture and practicing questions. So a few ways to cut down on this is watch lectures on 1.5 times the speed or double speed if you're comfortable with the subject. So you took criminal law in law school, you feel pretty good about it. I would watch it on 1.5 or double time the speed. That way you'll turn a three hour lecture into maybe an hour and a half and you'll have extra time to review the lecture and study. If it's a new subject, you know, you never took secure transactions, then maybe don't watch it on 1.5 times the speed because it will probably be hard to learn. Skip the lecture altogether if you know the subject well. Some people might be anxious about this, but for example, if you got an A plus in constitutional law, you know, you were the constitutional law scholar at your school or whatever, maybe you don't have to even watch that lecture. It might be, it might be something you already know. If you're not sure, you can always dive into some practice questions. And if you find you're doing great on them, then wonderful. If you think, oh, maybe my law school didn't cover this, then go back and watch the lecture. But that's one way to um, save time. And if you're a repeat taker, don't feel like you have to rewatch all the lectures that you've already watched. Instead, I would watch lectures on subjects that you struggle with rather than rewatching everything. So maybe you struggle with evidence and torts, rewatch those lectures, but you don't have to watch everything over again if you're a repeat taker. Don't skip self care. So I would take care of yourself, incorporate things like sleep, exercise, and breaks into your schedule. I know people don't like to do this because they like to say like, oh, I'm, I'm going to exercise less and I can study more, or I'm not going to take a break today. They almost feel like guilty about taking breaks, but it actually does make your studying a lot more productive. So I would recommend, recommend that you incorporate these right into your schedule. And in fact, they're on the schedule on the handout, just so that you can kind of like take care of yourself, increase your concentration, increase your focus when you're actually sitting down to study. And then memorize the law. People don't like the word memorize. Um, some professors that I talk to are like, oh, I hate it when you use that word, but I'm not sugarcoating it. You really have to know the law. Um, this is the mistake that I see a lot of first time and repeat takers make is they ask us like, why am I not getting this right? I know the law, I'm just having trouble applying it. 
But when we kind of get into it, I'll, I'll like start quizzing them. I say, okay, what are the four ways to sever a joint tenancy? You know, what are the four elements of a dying declaration? And if the student can't rattle them off off the top of their head, then they probably understand the law and they have a general idea of the law, but they haven't yet memorized the nuances of the law. And memorizing the nuances of the law is really important because the bar exam tests the nuances. Like the MBE is going to test a nuance of dying declaration. If you didn't memorize those elements, if you can't go through them and kind of check them off when you get a question on that, then you're probably going to get the question wrong because they're experts at tricking people. Um, so you might be most of the way there if you have a general understanding of the law, but you do have to take the time to kind of memorize it. So putting in time for memorization is key. I recommend you do this at your best time of day. I'm a morning person, so I could easily get up at 5 a.m. And when I was studying for the bar exam, I would get up really early and I would memorize because memorizing is a lot of work. It takes a lot of brain power. But some of our students you know, study the best at night or during the day. So they should be memorizing at their best time. If you're, if you're a night owl and you study best at 11 p.m. or whatever, then use your time to memorize then because you'll be the most focused then. Uh, repetition is key. And we have a lot of different bar exam memorization tips at this link if you have the handout and you're struggling with memorization. I'll also tell you some tips um, to memorize and study efficiently as we go along in this handout. Okay, so here's some MBE tips. So first I want to tell you to be aware of subject and topic frequency, because a lot of people don't know this when they take the bar exam. You will have seven MBE subjects and these are gonna be tested equally. So you're gonna have 25 questions on civil procedure, constitutional law, contracts and sales, criminal law and procedure, uh, real property, evidence, and torts. You'll have 25 questions on each of those. So they really are tested evenly. But the topics within each subject are not tested evenly. So the topics, we have a link here so you can see all of them, but I just want to illustrate an example. You can see in real property, for example, there are five to six questions on each subtopic, okay? So each one's worth about 20% of your score. Um, that means that, you know, it's not like you're going to see five questions on present and future interests. In fact, you'll probably see about two to three questions on present and future interests in real property. Okay, and there's also 25 scored questions on torts on the MBE. But you can see that negligence makes up 12 to 13 of these questions or 50% of them. And negligence also happens to be really highly tested on the essay portion of the uniform bar exam. It's also highly tested in California. And virtually every state bar exam that I've looked at, negligence is highly tested. So here's a mistake that I see some students make. They'll say, wow, I'm really struggling with either let's say the rule against perpetuities or present and future interests. And I'm also really struggling with negligence. So I'll say, I'm gonna spend Saturday looking at, you know, the rule against perpetuities and present and future interests. And I'm gonna spend Sunday focusing on negligence. Well, from an MBE perspective, and even from an essay perspective, honestly, that doesn't make a lot of sense because negligence is going to make up 50%, 12 to 13 questions on the MBE, and it could be a full essay question or at least a substantial portion of it. Versus present and future interest will probably be about like two to three of these questions on the MBE. And depending on what bar exam you're taking, it's typically not highly tested on the essay portion. It's tested occasionally on the uniform bar exam. So it's not that you should ignore it, but if you want to study effectively and efficiently for the bar exam, then like allocate your time in a way that makes sense. Negligence will be worth more points, even if you know uh, present and future interests are tested on the MEE in a given administration. So it makes more sense to focus on these highly tested topics and maximize the number of points that you get for your study time. And again, you can see a full chart at this link. Um, I just want to make people aware of that because a lot of people don't realize that going into the MBE, that they actually tell us exactly how things are scored and how many points are taken out of each subsection. I also highly recommend that you use real MBE questions. This tends to be a mistake that first time takers make. Um, some courses do not offer released MBE questions. Off the top of my head, I believe that Themis does. I know that JD Advising, my company, offers all released MBE questions. So if you sign up for our course, you'll get 1,700 like actual official NCBE released questions. 
I don't know about the other commercial courses. You can consult them if you're not sure. Um, but if you are taking a course that does not offer these released questions, it's not bad necessarily to take company invented questions. So like if Barbara or Kaplan invents their own questions, that's not bad, okay? Sometimes they have really good hard questions, but then you also wanna make sure that you are incorporating some real MBE questions into your practice. So for example, um, you can get one of these extra sources that we link to. We have an app with real MBE questions and there's other um, apps out there or books that you can get with released MBE questions like strategies and tactics, for example. Um, and these are questions that are released by the National Conference of Bar Examiners, which writes the bar exam. And they're the closest to what you'll see on the actual MBE day. So they'll prepare you for the format of the exam. They'll prepare you for the issues that they like to test. You know, they don't reinvent the wheel every time. So there's certain ways that they test certain issues. So I would recommend that if you're taking a course that does not have released or real MBE questions, that you um, get a supplement and at least do some ahead of time so that you're, you have that advantage as well. And again, the course questions usually aren't bad, but um, you just wanna make sure that you, you're using the best resource available. One other tip for MBE questions is not to rush through them. Some students will spend hours just answering MBE questions every day, you know, and I've seen on Reddit and other places where they say, okay, I'm answering a hundred questions a day, you know, and I'm going to do a hundred questions a day. The problem is they get the same score every time, you know, they're not seeing their score improve and they're spending all this time answering MBE questions. Instead, What's more beneficial is if you slow down and you answer the questions slowly and methodically. Um, some people who did research on the MBE when they were asked how many questions should you answer a day, they literally said you should answer six questions a day and you should take an hour to do them, okay? Which goes against what a lot of people do. And I don't necessarily think you need to answer only six questions a day, but I just wanna tell you that their point is well taken. Sometimes less can be more in terms of what you get out of a question. We do have a link to kind of a slow and methodical approach to MBE questions, but I'll just explain it briefly. Um, what I recommend you do is when you answer a question, start to dissect the question, okay? Ask yourself, what's the issue being tested? What's the legal rule? If you can't identify the issue, it might be a sign that you need to spend more time in your outlines. If you can identify the issue, but you can't state the rule, it might be a sign you need to work on memorization a little bit more. All right, and then see if you can answer the question before you even look at the answer choices. So try to say, okay, what's the answer to this question? And once you get to the answer choices, say, okay, this one's right and these three are wrong and this is the reason this is wrong, this is why this is wrong, this is why this is wrong. It's kind of a very slow and methodical approach. Um, a recent California taker that used this approach said that she raised her score by, I think it was 30 points or, or 30 percentiles or something by using this approach. She found it really beneficial because she stopped doing 100 questions a day and she started just doing less and trying to get more out of them. And I think that you will find a similar uh, benefit if you've been trying to just answer a bunch of questions, but you're not getting a lot out of it. Um, another thing I really recommend as part of this approach is that you um, either use, I'm old fashioned, so I like pen and paper, but some people find it effective to use a Google Doc or something and write down when you get something wrong. So like I would write down every reason I got a question wrong. Maybe I forgot the elements of a crime. Okay, I would write them down. Um, and then I would go back and review that Google Doc or that legal pad, you know, basically pretty much every day until I would no longer get those questions wrong. And I found that a really effective way to study. I felt like I was in control of the material and I was actually reviewing the material that I didn't know over and over again because I would keep track of it on a separate piece of paper or a Google Doc. And incorporate timed MBE practice questions into your schedule. So start early, especially if you struggled with um, timing in law school, I would really recommend that you start incorporating timed exams early on. So doing something like 33 questions in an hour when you start studying, and then maybe 66 questions in two hours, your, your third and fourth weeks of bar prep or later down the line, and then pretty soon 100 questions in three hours. If you are taking an online bar exam, um, then this might be set up a little bit differently. You might have an hour and a half break and 50 questions in the first hour and a half, and then 50 questions in the second hour and a half, 
and then lunch, and then you kind of repeat that. So just tweak it to whatever your bar exam is going to look like in July. And then plan for test day two. If you're taking the MBE in person, I would recommend you develop a Scantron strategy so that you can allow yourself to move on if you don't know the answer. Like what I did on MBE day is um, I, if I didn't know a question completely, but I, I was pretty confident, but not 100% sure, I would have my Scantron and I'd put like a dot next to the number. And if I got to a question and I just completely guessed, or I didn't know it literally at all, I would put a dash next to it, okay? And then at the end, uh, so I basically made it through all 100 questions. And then at the end, I would go back and I would review all of the dashes, okay? The ones that I really didn't know. And if I still had time after that, I would review all of the ones that I had placed dots next to. And maybe I didn't have time. I don't even remember, honestly. Um, but basically that kind of allows you to prioritize. You'll get through all of the questions and yet you can still come back to the ones that you really didn't know at all. Okay, some essay tips here. I would recommend that you write several essays each week. I honestly recommend about 50 essay answers prior to taking the bar exam. Some people are surprised by that, but remember they don't reinvent the wheel. They tend to test the same issues over and over again. And you'll put yourself at a very big advantage if you practice essays ahead of time. Um, partly because a lot of people don't practice essays. So even if they're smart and they know the law well, they're honestly not prepared for the essay portion of the exam because they haven't reviewed these topics and they haven't looked at the essays before. So if you've reviewed them and you've looked at them, you'll be putting yourself at, a, at an advantage. If you've ever known of somebody who um, did really well in law school or has a great firm job and they still failed the bar exam, often it's because they did not practice enough essays. Um, we had somebody who graduated at the, I can't remember if she was number one, but she was close. She had like a 3.9 in law school and she failed the bar exam the first time because she didn't do any MEEs ahead of time. She literally just focused on multiple choice questions. She said, oh, I'll be fine on the essay portion. Um, and so she failed the bar exam. So on her repeat attempt with us, we made it a priority. We said, okay, you know, we know you didn't do any essays with your last course and it wasn't her course's fault. They assigned us and she just didn't do them. Um, so come to us and we're going to like put you on a schedule where you're writing a lot of practice essays and her score improved dramatically. I mean, she got an amazing score and um, honestly, who cares what your score is as long as you pass the bar exam, but that gave her a nice buffer. She passed with flying colors. She could have just avoided the whole thing, you know, having to fail the bar exam once and then take it again if she would have practiced essays the first time. And this kind of brings me to my next point, which is to use Iraq. So state the issue, um, state the rule, apply the law and conclude on your bar exam essay answer. Graders are actually going to be looking for this, even though you might wanna try to do something fancy or get out of this format, I wouldn't recommend it. They're, they have a checklist and they're going through to see, did you capture every component of Iraq in your answer? When I talk to essay graders, the number one thing they say is um, actually the, Oh, sorry. It looks like someone's mic is on here. Okay. Um, the number one thing that essay grader, like actual bar exam essay graders say is first they say pay attention to the call to question because a lot of people um, ignore what the actual question is asking. And then the second thing they say is please use Iraq. Like we're looking for an Iraq format. Um, don't write law school essay answers to bar exam questions. If you're in California, you can ignore me right now because California essays are very similar to law school style essays. But most state bar exams and the uniform bar exam um, is not, they don't test uh, legal topics in the same way that law schools do. And by that, I mean their questions are usually shorter. Oftentimes they'll tell you what the issues are, not always, but oftentimes you're not hunting for the issues in the same way that you would in a law school fact pattern. And one of the big differences on bar exam essays and law school essays is on bar exam essays, you often won't be um, arguing back and forth. Oftentimes it's simply applying the law and concluding. So in law school, you'd probably get the most points for this crafty analysis and oh, the plaintiff argues this, the defendant argues this. On the bar exam, it's actually simpler in some ways because they just want you to apply the elements of the law and then arrive at a conclusion. And usually there is a right conclusion on bar exam essays. So it's not like law school essays where, you know, oh, it could go either way. Typically on bar exam answer, uh, essay answers, there is a right answer that they're looking for. California is an exception. 
oftentimes you will be arguing both sides and sometimes there's not a right answer. So California essay answers do tend to mimic law school um, exams. Uh, gauge your progress through self-grading. This is actually one of our students' favorite tips and we've seen um, great results from self-grading. So when I took the bar exam, I took a commercial course um, and I handed in one essay and I got a six out of 10. And then I handed in another essay and I got a six out of 10. And I didn't feel very good about getting a six out of 10 on my essays. I mean, that wasn't quite passing, okay, in my state at the time. But I didn't feel bad about it. I didn't let it get me down because I had been self-grading. So I'd been actually um, analyzing my own work and comparing it to the model answer every time I did a practice essay. So I kind of knew I was on track to pass the bar exam, even if my grader didn't give me a high score. I, I stopped turning in essays and I said, no, I, I know I'm on track based on my own self-grading. Self-grading can give you confidence. And more importantly, it's the best way to see your score exponentially improve. So how do you self-grade your bar exam essays? What I recommend you do is type out your answer or handwrite it if you're gonna be handwriting it and then compare it to the model answer and say, did I identify the issues? Did I state the rules correctly? Did I apply the law correctly? And did I arrive at a correct conclusion? And go through your answer literally with like a red pen or a different color font and grade it like you're an actual grader, like you're a teacher or professor giving yourself feedback. And this will help you improve very quickly because all of a sudden you're not just someone taking the exam, you're in the mindset of a grader. And you can kind of get into the bar exam grader mindset, you'll naturally start writing essays that bar exam essay graders want to see. You'll write essays that are organized and hopefully more accurate and concise as you start self-grading. Um, just as a, as a side note, in our own courses, we used to encourage students to self-grade, but we wouldn't require it um, before they handed an essay answer. But what we found was the students that were self-grading were improving much more quickly and they also were passing the bar exam at higher rates that now we require for all of our students before they submit essays we say just go through and compare your answer to the model answer first hand it into us we'll tell you you know additional things that you could probably improve on and additional points that you're doing well on but um that strategy has worked so well for our students that it's just something that we um, tell them to do for their own benefit uh, be aware of the highly tested essay subjects. So not all subjects or topics are tested equally on the, sub, on the um, bar exam. So here's our MEE chart. So this is going to be relevant for you if you're taking the uniform bar exam. We also have a link to uh, Michigan if you happen to be in Michigan, California. So a couple other frequency charts. But you can see something like civil procedures tested very frequently. And you can see something like conflicts of law is not tested very frequently. Okay, so be aware of that when you study. Some, I was looking at one student's study schedule and she was studying, you know, torts, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Conflicts of law, um, you know, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And it just didn't make sense in terms of how often conflict of law was tested to be spending three full days on it in the same amount of time that she's going to be spending on torts, which is going to be graded on the, or scored on the essay portion and the MBE portion. And of course, you don't want to ignore conflict of laws. I mean, you want to know it. It's a topic that could definitely come up, but um, you don't want to necessarily allocate days and days of study time to it when it's less likely, um, even if it is tested, to be worth a significant amount of points. So um, pay attention to highly tested subjects. It can help guide your studying efficiently. Also focus on the highly tested topics of law. For example, civil procedure on the MEE, you can see that they love subject matter jurisdiction Personal jurisdiction's okay. It's not as popular as some people think it is, um, but it's still pretty popular. And um, they actually randomly really like to test transfer to a more appropriate forum. So if you know these highly tested uh, topics on the bar exam, then you can actually maximize your studying because you're gonna be able, you're gonna make sure that you, you are able to articulate these highly tested areas of law that you're likely to see. And we do have free guides on these highly tested areas of law. So we have an MEE topics guide, um, one for California and one for Michigan, so that you can see, depending on what state you're in, the topics that tend to be tested over and over again. Now, should you limit your studying to these topics? No. But should you focus on them? 
yes, I would make sure that you're focusing on these and that you are um, committing these to memory. Sometimes it's hard when you have like a whole stack of outlines and you say, okay, I just don't have enough time to memorize everything. Well, this is how you can make it more manageable and efficient. Start by memorizing the most highly tested areas of law and then go back to the less highly tested areas of law. And that way you'll maximize your chance of passing. Okay, some performance test tips. The number one mistake that we see with the MPT is people just don't practice it. Um, it's worth 20% of your score in most jurisdictions, including UBE jurisdictions. So what I recommend is as a default, spend about 20% of your time, of, of your study time, focusing on the MPT portion of the bar exam. So if you're studying five days a week, Monday through Friday, I would spend one day focusing on the MPT. That's literally 20% of your time. I would get the, MP, the basic MPT formatting down. We have a free one sheet and I put it right in the handout. Um, but basically this is kind of like a different formatting that they expect to see for different tasks. And I know that some, um, I think that some courses don't honestly have the best MPT instruction. We've literally read every MBT and kind of like distilled this into different formats that they like to see answers written in. So for example, if you have a persuasive brief or objective memo, these are the two most popular MBT tasks. And this is the general format that they expect you to use when you're writing your memo or when you're writing your brief. Um, for example, they'll expect you to do an introduction, discussion, and conclusion for the objective memo. And if you can get this um, format down ahead of time and you just memorize these formats, then immediately when the grader sees your answer, they're going to say, okay, well, they wrote it in the right format. You know, you got one thing down, you're giving the grader a little bit of confidence in your answer before they even look at it. Um, so these are the general formats for the different types of tasks that you'll see. And again, the persuasive brief and objective memo are the most common on the MPT, but you will occasionally see letters or something kind of random, like a wildcard task. Um, always time yourself when you try MPTs. So some timing tips, um, and it, actually before I even go into the tips, I'll say that a lot of people run out of time on the MPT portion. After the bar exam is over, we get a lot of emails from people we don't even know um, that are like, oh, I ran out of time. Like, does that mean I failed the bar exam? And the answer is no, it does not mean you failed the bar exam. It happens to a lot of people, but you are missing out on points that you could otherwise probably capture. So a few ways to try to um, stay, you know, in time on the MPTs are first, when you practice, make it a priority to time yourself. Anybody can write, a, I shouldn't say anybody, but a lot of law students can write a good objective memo if they have endless amounts of time. The trick is to try to write a good objective memo in the 90 minutes that you have to write that memo. So make it a priority to time yourself when you're actually answering these questions. Outline and write while you read. Um, this is a tip that all of our tutors swear by. Uh, they say that when they're working on the MPT, they'll be reading the file, they'll be reading the library, and they'll start to outline their answer while they're reading. You don't have to read everything and then start writing. You can actually start doing some of the work as you are reading the MPT itself. Don't brief cases during your MPT. Um, somebody's going around giving bad advice or for some reason students have it in their head that they should brief cases. And just in case you're wondering what I'm talking about, the MPT will have um, basically like the facts of a case. So they'll give you, you know, client transcripts or deposition transcripts or something like that in this file, they call it. And then they'll give you the law in a library. So they'll usually give you cases. Sometimes they'll give you statutes as well. Um, but usually they'll have about three cases and some students will start by briefing every case. Generally not a winning strategy. You're not expected to brief cases. You won't use those brief cases, uh, those case briefs, and it takes a lot of time. So I would stay away from doing that. And then find a strategy that works best for you. What works best for most of our students is to read the task memo. This will tell you exactly what to do. It'll say, um, you know, start by, it'll say write an objective memo, you know, don't include the facts, do blah, blah, blah. So read the task memo. Then look at the library or the law, and then look at the file or the facts. That's what most students find effective when they answer an MPT, but figure out what works best for you. Try it, you know, try looking at it in different ways. For example, I find it most effective to read the task memo, then the file, then the library, but I'm in a minority. 
Um, most of our students find it most effective to read the task memo, then the library, then the file. So basically spend enough time on the MPT where you can have an approach that works for you and you know what that is prior to exam day. All right, I, I know we have some Q&A, so I'm gonna try to get through these last couple tips. Um, get mentally ready for the bar exam. I highly recommend trying things like affirmation, using visualization and positive thinking before the bar exam. Some people go into the bar exam and they say, oh, I know I'm gonna run out of time and I'm not prepared and blah, blah, blah. Don't go into the bar exam with that kind of self-talk. Instead, go in and think, you know, I've studied for this, I put in the time. Um, so something that some of our students like to remind themselves is that in most states, you only really need a D to pass the bar exam. So you don't need 100%. In fact, you usually need around a 65% to pass. Um, that makes some people feel better ahead of time. But I would try to get mentally ready for the bar exam because it is a mental task, um, you know, just as much as, as it is knowing the law, it's being mentally prepared to take the bar exam. There's also some really interesting new science that says it can be beneficial to get excited about the bar exam. So if you're feeling really nervous and you're kind of like anxious, a lot of people will, you know, say, okay, I'm going to try to relax, you know, and they'll use deep breathing exercises and that's great. But sometimes it's hard to go from that like anxious energy to all of a sudden relaxing. It's like the opposite emotion on the spectrum. And so there was a study that I found really intriguing that said, instead of like trying to, you know, turn off this, you know, energy that you have, just channel it. And instead of being nervous, try to get excited for the bar exam. Like, okay, I'm really excited maybe to get this over with. I'm excited to show what I know. Um, you know, and it might sound kind of cheesy, but if you get excited about it, it's not like it's a closer emotion. Uh, excitement is a closer emotion to anxiety than, you know, calming down is. So it's easier to channel that. And students who, you know, in this study that I linked to, um, students who do get excited about exams actually do better on them. They have more positive energy. Um, and they did a study where they told people to like calm down and then they told people to get excited. And the people who got excited for the test actually did much better on it. They also had, um, they did the same thing with public speaking. They had some people perform a speech. Uh, they told half the group to calm down before the speech. They told the other half to try to get like a, get excited and enthusiastic for the speech. And the people that were more excited for it did better than the control group that was told to calm down or um, not told anything at all. So it's something that you can use, especially if you tend to be a little bit more on the anxious side. I recommend it and our students have found it helpful. Um, and then practice under time conditions in the setting that you'll be in on exam day. I particularly recommend this if you're taking an online bar exam, you actually have quite an advantage. I would, if possible, sit in the same room that you'll be taking the exam in, use the same laptop that you'll be taking the exam on. Um, you might discover like your chair's uncomfortable or there's like a glare in the window that like goes on your screen and you know it's hard to see or something like that or it gets too hot or too cold or your neighbor's mowing the lawn or whatever. You might discover something um, that you wanna change or tweak prior to taking the bar exam. The other nice thing is, is you'll be used to that environment. So if you practice in that environment, then exam day won't seem that different, you know, um, than your regular practice. And you'll probably perform pretty consistently with how you've performed on the practice tests. I know that I personally have found this helpful, even like when I give speeches, I gave a um, speech through the law school admissions council and we had over a thousand students and normally I don't get nervous about speaking but I was nervous for that because I was like I don't want to mess up in front of a thousand people um, and so I practiced right in the place that I was actually speaking in I felt more comfortable um, you know when I actually gave my presentation and it was almost like it was just another practice round rather than you know something I was doing for the very first time which helped me feel less anxious. So those are our 20 tips. I know I went through them kind of quickly. And I also know that we have some great questions, which I haven't uh, touched on. So I don't know, Nisa, what the best strategy is for answering these questions, but I will defer to you. So um, thank you for that presentation, by the way. That was amazing um, and just chock full of valuable information. And I that's the kind of presentation I wish I had when I first started studying for the bar exam. So, so thank you for that. Um, I think what we'll do is um, I have a list of questions here. We can just go through as many as we can. 
Um, and if we don't get through all of them, then they can maybe uh, reach out to us via LinkedIn. I, I have those links in the chat box. So um, how does that sound? That sounds great to me. And anybody's welcome to reach out to me on LinkedIn as well. So please feel free to add me. Um, perfect. Okay. So the first one we can start with is what are your recommendations for a study plan if you also work full time? That's a really good question. And we have a lot of students who are working full time and, you know, studying for the bar exam, which is really burning the candle at both ends. Um, the best thing I recommend is to first set up a schedule and try to minimize your outside commitments. So for example, what's worked well for a lot of our students is studying in the morning before work. There's, even if they're not morning people, honestly, there's less distractions, you know, at five or 6 a.m. And so if they can get in a couple hours of studying, it's usually their best time if they can have a big cup of coffee, you know, they haven't thought about too many other things. Um, and usually people aren't texting at that time or kind of like bothering you. So I recommend studying in the morning before work, kind of like get it done. Um, and then maybe studying a little bit after work, but like making, making morning time a priority. That seems to work really well for our students. And then I also recommend focusing on the highly tested areas of law and being as efficient as possible in your studying. Um, some first time takers who have all day to study, and I was one of them, you know, it's easier to be like, oh, I want to learn every little nuance and oh yeah, maybe this isn't tested, but I'm going to like go look and do it anyway. Um, and you know, if you're studying as a, as a, also someone who's working full time, you don't really have that luxury. Um, so I would recommend that you instead focus on the highly tested topics and make those a true priority because you really, at the end of the day, you have to pass the exam. So you want to focus on what's actually being tested on the exam. That's a really good question. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Um, so this kind of dovetails into the next question. Um, if you are strapped for time and you find yourself sort of at the end and, you know, uh, how would you sort of efficiently allocate your time? Um, are there shortcuts or are there things that, you know, uh, they can focus on um, that, that would just help them? Um, yes. So one of the posts that we have on our site, which is actually a little more popular than it should be, is um, it's something like how to pass the bar exam in 10 days or something, <laughs> um, which tells me that a lot of people procrastinate. It really depends on what the student's uh, weakness or issue is. Um, like, for example, if somebody hasn't written any essays, I would say bullet point essays. You know, you want to be able to write out a few full essays, too. But at that point, the main uh, purposes of your studying would be to get exposed to how topics are tested. And the best way to do that quickly is to go back and bullet point essays. So you're not spending a ton of time writing full answers, but you're still getting exposed to how topics are tested. For people who have not done MPTs, I would make that a priority because it's, it's an area to gain a lot of points without actually memorizing any law. But you still have to practice the skills ahead of time so that you get it down on exam day. Um, and then other than that, it really is person specific. And I'll just give you one last example to show you like what I mean by that. We had a student who came to us, it was maybe three weeks before the bar exam. Her MBE score was extremely low. It was like in the bottom fifth percentile. She, she took in the bar exam a couple of times and her MBE score hadn't really been improving on her practice tests. Um, so it was like in the bottom fifth percentile. She just had a ton of work to do on the MBE but her essays were good and she was a great writer. So we took, I, I talked to her and I said, okay, we're gonna take a little bit of a risk, but I think we might, this is the only way that you have any chance of, I think really passing this round and I think we can pull it off. And what we did was I knew that she wasn't gonna be able to improve her MBE score exponentially, you know, in the, in the couple of weeks that we had, it just wasn't gonna happen. Um, she had to memorize more of the law. She had to understand more of the nuances. And honestly, we didn't have the time. But she was such a great writer. I said, let's make the written portion your strength. Most bar exams, the UBE included, that you don't have to get a certain score on each portion of the bar exam. You just need an overall passing score. So she needed like a 270. So we worked really hard on the written portion and we made that our primary focus. She didn't ignore the MBE. And we tried to, our goal is to get her MBE score up about 10 points which we did. It was nowhere near passing. Um, passing would have been a 135 and she was getting about a 120 at the end. She came in with about a 110. 
Um, so anyway, we focused a lot on the essays. We made that like her super strength and she passed the bar exam with a 270 exactly. It was the exact score she needed. Wow. And, you know, I would have loved more of a buffer, but, but we did it and that's all that counts. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, so the next question that we have is, um, what is your advice if you're seeing the subject matter for the first time? So classes like evidence, uh, secure transactions, things that, you know, not everyone's required to take in law school. Um, do you have any advice on sort of how to approach those subjects differently? Yes. Um, when I took the bar exam, I was in this boat a lot because I did not take secure transactions. I didn't take corporations. Um, or business organizations or anything like that, or wills and trusts or family law. There were a lot of classes that I didn't take that were tested on the bar exam. And what I find most effective is it's imperative to go to lecture um, on those topics because you really have to have an overview of it and it's helpful to you know, have it explained. Then I would memorize the lecture handout and try to really review it until you feel like you understand it. So it's not just memorizing the law, but making sure you understand it. If you don't understand it, then you could consider something like a study group, a tutor, Google what you don't understand, um, but try to like gain a good understanding of it while you're memorizing it. And then, and this is probably the most important piece, look at the essays. Um, a lot of the subjects that people don't take that are tested on the bar exam are essay subjects because most of the MBE subjects are taught your first year besides evidence and crim pro. Um, so a lot of the our essay subjects, so I would go and look at the essays and go through as many of them as possible, because sometimes what I've found is that courses will teach the law in like a very either nuanced way or a very particular way. And that's actually not how those topics are tested on the essay portion. So once you have a foundation of the law, once you went to the lecture, you memorize the handout, then go to the essays themselves and start bullet pointing them. And you're gonna find patterns. You're gonna find things that might not be in your bar exam course lecture handout that are tested on the essays um, and vice versa. Maybe something you know was emphasized a lot in your course and it's also emphasized a lot in the essays, but it's good to know that ahead of time. So doing as many past essays as possible is really kind of critical. And I think like in my own studying that helped me you know, succeed on the corporations question that I was given. Um, because again, I didn't take it in law school. I thought it was a really hard subject and doing the past essays was what ultimately led to getting a high score on that question. Yeah, that's, that's super helpful. Um, do you have any recommendations for supplements? Um, we have a lot of really good free resources on our website. So um, I linked to a lot of them in the handout, but we have guides on the highly tested topics for the MEE. Um, guides on highly tested topics for California. We have charts that show you when the different MPTs were tested and when uh, MEEs were tested and blog posts on basically like every topic that you probably want to know about. Um, so I think that those are great free resources. The other supplements that I recommend that people get if they don't already have access to them are the real MBE questions. Um, we offer real MBE questions, Adaptive Bar offers them. The Strategies and Tactics book is one I recommend and you can get it on Amazon. I think they came out with a new edition like in the last year. My recommendation would be just go to one source. Don't buy, some people buy JD Advising, Adaptive Bar, Strategies and Tactics, and they're, we're all using questions from the same pool. There's only about 1700 released questions. So if you buy all of our resources, you're gonna be getting all the same questions you know, from all of us. So I would recommend just starting with one source for the um, MBE questions. Yeah, that, that's a good tip. Um, what are your pros and what are the pros and cons of taking the bar exam early, um, particularly during three all year? That's a really good question. Um, a lot of states don't allow this anymore, so they don't let people take the bar exam their third year of law school. Some states do allow it. The cons are most people who do this will not um, do very well in their law school classes because they're going to be focusing solely on the bar exam. <laughs> Um, but the pros are you can be licensed, you know, pretty soon after uh, graduation. I mean, I imagine this would be people taking the bar exam in February of the real year. Um, so you can be licensed literally pretty soon after graduation or even at the time of graduation, which can mean you could start practicing sooner. You could start making that attorney salary sooner, um, which can be beneficial. Uh, when I was in law school, I took the bar, I, I graduated like a semester early. So I took the February bar exam. 
And then I was licensed at the time of my graduation, like graduation with the rest of my class. Um, and it was nice to be already licensed at the time I was graduating. One of my classmates took it with me and she didn't pass. So basically um, she passed the second time she took it though. So she was just licensed with the rest of our class, which was kind of nice. So it can take some of the pressure off. But in general, it is hard to balance both. And to be honest, when most students try to study for the bar exam while they're taking law school classes, usually what just falls by the wayside is the law school classes. And I know some professors criticize this and they've kind of pushed to have that option to take the bar exam early as something that's basically not available to students. And by and large, they've been mostly successful. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, is there such a thing as starting too early to study? That's a really good question. Um, I like to start a little bit early because I'm neurotic <laughs> as most law students are. And we have some students that will literally start six months earlier, um, usually based on their work schedule or something else. And I don't think that it's necessarily bad to start kind of early. The people that I would recommend to start early are people who have a crazy schedule, like they work full time, maybe they have kids they have to take care of full time, they have some other obligations that's basically taking up a lot of their time during the day. Um, so for them, it's beneficial to start early. The other group of people I recommend start early are people who did not do very well their first year of law school. If somebody did not do well their first year of law school, they're going to have a lot more to make up for by the time they get to the bar exam. And um, it's going to feel more over overwhelming to them. People who did great their first year of law school, um, typically bar prep, they still may feel like a little bit overwhelmed, but typically it's a little bit easier for them to catch up and relearn the material than people who did not do very well. So for people who didn't do well their first year, I often think it's a good idea for them to start early. They're maximizing their chances of passing the bar exam the first time, um, which is always a, a big bonus. And we also have some students who are just kind of anxious and they like to get a head start on things. So they'll start early too. If you do start early, my best advice for you is to come up with a retention schedule because the number one problem that people who start early have is they will start you know, six months early, they'll start with real property and they literally forget all of real property by the time they get to the bar exam. Yeah. Um, they started too early, they started studying too early. So what we do for those students is we set up weeks for them specifically to review, to take memorization quizzes on those subjects, to go back and revisit something that they had looked at. And that way um, they're keeping it all in their mind. And so they're not scrambling at the end because that's the real downfall of starting early is this um, like, I guess, you know, this potential to forget what you've already learned. So you have to basically just be aware of that risk and minimize it. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, the one thing I'd add to that is to also be mindful of just burnout, right? Like you're yeah. already coming off of your three all classes, you're already probably tired, um, and you're ready and you know anxious to sort of get started. Um, that can get uh, get overwhelming at times too. So just be kind of mindful of the the burnout, and you know ultimately it's just knowing yourself at the end of the day and sort of how um, how much time you think you need to be able to to get this information down. That's a great point. That's a very real risk too, is just spending too much time and then losing steam at the end when it matters the most. <laughs> yeah, 100%. Um, so one question we have here in the chat is, should we study two subjects in a day or focus on one subject at a time, at least in the beginning? That's a really good question. Um, it depends a little bit on your preference. What we do in our courses is we always, we start with one subject Week one is real property. Why? Because people don't like real property. It's the hardest subject on the bar exam, kind of tied with contracts. It happens to be my favorite subject, so it's also kind of easy to put first. Um, but also, people, we start with it, they can focus solely on real property, master it. And then by the end, often always, it's everyone's favorite subject, which I love. Um, and I think that in the beginning, it does help students to just kind of start with one subject, you know, for week one and then start to add them. However, one thing that you do want to do as bar prep goes on is kind of revisit subjects that you've learned. Um, so that if you do learn real property in week one, you don't forget it by week eight or whatever. So it is helpful to kind of set up a schedule to kind of review and revisit topics that you've looked at before. But yeah, I think in the beginning, just starting with one subject a day is it can help make it more manageable. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, 
So I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions here. Um, what are your top three tips for the MBE? Just absolute top tips. Or did you say the MBE or MEE? MB, MBE. MBE. Yeah. Uh, my top three tips are, okay, if I'm gonna re-summarize them, a lot of them are in my handout. But first, make sure you've memorized the nuances of the law. They'll, they'll trick people on the nuances. Yeah. And the number one reason people do not do well is not is because they just don't know the nuances of the law. Occasionally it's an application issue, but almost always they just literally can't restate the law. Uh, the second one would be to use real questions, like I said, because it can really prepare you for the format of the exam. And the third one would be to not do 100 questions a day. People who have this, um, you know, this mindset of I need to do 5,000 questions before the bar exam don't do very well on the MBE. And oftentimes they fail the bar. Um, when I took the bar exam, I did not, I probably did less than a thousand MBE practice questions. And, you know, it was mostly learning the law and getting prepared for the format of the questions that helped me the most, not necessarily doing a million practice questions. Yeah. Um, so last question here. Uh, what are your thoughts on if you only have, say, two weeks to study for the bar exam, what are your thoughts on sort of only focusing on the MBE instead of the, and trying, instead of trying to do everything? Um, so a lot of people do that. I don't think that is necessarily a good approach and I'll tell you why. Basically for most people, it's much easier, not everyone, but for most people, it's much easier to dramatically improve an essay score in two weeks than it is to dramatically improve an MBE score in two weeks. So what I mean by that is MBE score improvement is usually linear. like you learn the law, you do practice questions, over time, you'll see your score improve. Unless you're making some major mistakes, it's not gonna improve super quickly. It's more of a gradual improvement. And you can see huge improvement and we have students that see that, but they put in the time, they put in the effort, it's very linear. Yeah. Um, for the essay portion, what we find is if people just start to practice, if they focus on the highly tested issues or for the MPTs, if they're doing MPTs in time settings or getting those formats down, you can see exponential improvement in two weeks. Um, so oftentimes people who are just on the brink of passing, you know, in those last two weeks before the bar exam, I'll say, let's shift your focus to where you're gonna really see some dramatic improvement, especially if they haven't practiced a lot of essays or MPTs. And oftentimes that's their saving grace on the bar exam and they'll end up passing because of that. So that's what, that would be the, the flawed approach to mostly focusing on the MBE. That makes sense. Well, we are at time here. Actually, we're right on time. Um, 